um, go into this completely again, but sort of use this as uh, um, a way to go over it and sort of put it to a picture. So when we talk about the gut uh, and we talk about you know, the whole digestive system from the mouth um, to the rectum, there's so many things that go into uh, how important that is. But especially when we talk about just that full two-way highway of you know, the feedback that it gives to the brain and then what it tells and signals the rest of the body. So everything from neurotransmitters to the immune system to the brain, that if we don't have a proper functioning gut, that we really have a hard time being able to live optimally. And the gut, the other thing that I think is just fascinating though is how good the gut is at disguising itself. So a lot of times we don't even realize that gut problems are gut problems. You know, a lot of people will come in and not even realize that it's their gut that needs the attention. So this sort of shows, I think, the three most important parts, which is how these cells, which is that single layer um, of cells that are in the gut. So when I talked about vitamin D, it's vitamin D that wraps around these and keeps them together. So what happens then is that if there's improper feedback, we start to get neurotransmitters off because all of a sudden those neurotransmitters are getting improper signals. We start to see changes in the bacteria and we start to see an increase in inflammation. And those pro-inflammatory um, chemicals like the cytokines, what they do then is that they'll then activate that immune response everywhere and that inflammation response everywhere. So that's one of the reasons why we put a lot of emphasis on the gut and gut healing while we're doing everything else when it comes to managing and helping to support our patients, especially our Lyme patients. And then here are some other things that we do at the clinic at Stillwater. Uh, I know some of you uh, have gone to see Dr. Bush. So uh, some of the Lyme support that we do is we do nutritional and light IV therapies, uh, SIBO diagnosis and treatments, uh, we do hormone management, so take a look at hormones and see what we can do to help manage those. Uh, and the hormones aren't just the sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. We also do a lot of things with the adrenal and the stress glands um, and thyroid, especially with a lot of our chronic patients because we find we can't get ahead of a lot of the things we're doing unless those are balanced and on board with care. Um, neurotransmitters, so we do everything from neurotransmitter testing to helping to balance it. Um, and neurotransmitter support. Um, we do testing for other chronic infections, um, chronic um, sinusitis and treatments. Uh, we do autoimmune support, and then obviously uh, we do Lyme testing and test interpretations and Lyme programs. If any of you guys would like to keep updated, uh, know more about Stillwater uh, and things that are going on, uh, the web page is uh, Stillwater Natural, or you can find it under Natural Medicine of Stillwater. Uh, so you can go there. Uh, I also personally too have done, uh, I do a podcast. It's uh, called Beyond the Basics Health Academy. And I've done some, uh, have been lucky enough to interview some great individuals um, with Lyme. Um, so we've done everything from genetic testing. Um, Bob Miller, who does a lot of the genetic software, uh, and does work with genetic information. He's been on twice. Uh, I've had um, a couple Lyme patients come on and talk about their journey. And we have a really good Lyme um, podcast about supporting somebody with Lyme because I think that unfortunately uh, individuals don't get the support that they need from loved ones uh, when they're battling Lyme. And then here's the information for natural medicine of Stillwater. Uh, the phone number is 651-342-1043. You can check out more at um, Facebook or go to stillwaternatural.com um, and learn about both Nirvana, which is the testing for SIBO that Dr. Bush does, and uh, other things that we do at Stillwater. Uh, Molly is the front desk receptionist. She is um, just a bundle of sunshine. So if you guys have any questions, she knows a lot. Uh, or you can email and she'll be happy to get back to you at office at natural or at stillwaternatural.com. All right. <laughs> we can take some questions. I have a comment. I, I'm just um, two weeks out of my treatment on the antibiotic. Yes. I feel a 
lot better. Yep. It's amazing. I, I, if you had told me it would have made such a big difference in mm -hmm. how I felt, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to believe it, but it, I do feel a lot better. And I think that that's so important because what we see so many times too is that, uh, and this is sort of what I was saying at the beginning, is we're not used to realizing that with chronic problems and concerns, there really is so much that we have to address. And even with the primary problem, um, is being addressed and treated right, that a lot of times we have to look at those other puzzle pieces. And we see that all the time. You know, we have people come in and they're even a little bit hesitant, like what does this have to do with me or is it gonna make that big of a difference? And we really get that feedback a lot, is that by putting this piece of puzzle and how important it is for us to really rebalance the brain and gut, that it can make a big difference in every aspect of life. Yeah. You said that they do the in-house testing once a month, is that correct? Just once a month they do the in-house. If you want to go and sit there for three hours, but they mail it out every day of the week. So if you want to do it just in the comfort of your own home, locally you can, they have a couple different uh, options. So you can either go and pick it up, bring it home, do it, and then bring it back, or you can mail it even locally too. And then do you, with the, I know you have a, do you, you go on a special diet usually with the, with the treatment. Do you have to stay on that diet after the treatment? Nope. No, so that's really, so that's another thing too, is that because of the approach um, that we are taking, you know, it's about then rebuilding the bacteria and then rebuilding the gut. So we do it sort of in stages, but by rebuilding the gut, we can return you to a more normal diet. So how much is the consult and the test? So you'd have to call Molly for that. I'm terrible with prices. So I can give you a general idea though. The test, because he does the in-office one, I want to say the test is 170. Um, it's somewhere between 120 and 170. You might know better with prices. Um, Bradley charges like for um, an appointment at $180 an hour, but he'll divide that hour up if you only take 15 minutes. He'll just charge you how much it tastes. And I don't remember how much the test was. Okay. The test, I'm better with the test. I didn't know how much he charged per. Um, but the test is somewhere between 120 and 170. So, um, so yeah, he, that's one of the reasons why he brought it in office is to make it cheaper. And then repeat tests are less. So that's the nice thing too is before, you know, we were looking at $200 for every test and if we repeated it, the company out in California didn't care. It was 200 every. But if people um, are repeat testers, he gives a significant discount because he wants to make sure those methane and hydrogen gases are coming down. Yeah. Is, is it related to right the, the No, it's in a different category. Yep, so it's a different category. So it's Zyfaxin or uh, Rifaximin. So, but yeah, it's not the same as the Rifampicin. And I'm also assuming that this isn't something that if you just go to your primary care doc in the line of the they even talk about, usually. Yeah. You've got maybe a, you've now got maybe a 10% chance. Um, so <laughs> it's better than it used to be zero. Uh, primary, I would actually say primary, haven't heard of it much, but a lot of gastroenterologists now do. Um, but still that, the gastroenterologist world of it is really weird. I have some gastroenterologists that I'll even send them, like my patients to, with a positive SIBO test and they're like, oh, this is great, let's treat this. And I've had other people who've had that test done with their gastroenterologist because they want to follow up and say, listen, we found it. And they'll be like, oh no, this isn't it. And, but they'll know what SIBO is. So I've had a really hit or, mic, uh, hit or miss when it comes to the uh, gastroenterologist world. So, but they have at least heard of it. So most, most of them have. Anybody else? How much vitamin D do you recommend for winter? Yep. So great question. Uh, and so I sort of depends on what your level is uh, right off the bat. So people can pretty much, everyone here especially, can be pretty safe at 5,000 in the winter, 2,000 in the summer um, is, a, is a safe amount. But it all depends on what your level is. So people, I have a lot of people in this area that come in to see me who, you know, are in the 20s. So I would like to see you at least 50 and preferably closer to 80. Those are sort of my target range for optimal function. And so if we need to, what I'll do sometimes is increase the dose a little bit more um, for a while and then recheck and see where you're at. I will also see a lot of individuals, and this is actually a good sort of 
sign uh, that you can almost do a little bit of a diagnosis. If you're taking tons and tons of vitamin D and you know even taking 2,000 a day or taking 5,000 a day and you're not seeing your vitamin D level move at all, that's almost always GI inflammation. So instead of absorbing it and utilizing it, it's just sort of going through you. So those are individuals then that we might need to put on a larger dose for a little bit, heal the gut, recheck them and then get them back down. Another interesting thing that I think is important about being in this um, uh, latitude is to know that really between um, September to May, we're tilted away from the sun. So even the days that we're, we feel like there's sunshine, we're just not getting enough because we're tilted away. So that's why I go up to 5,000 on anybody who doesn't want to check, they'll be safe. And then if we check, sometimes I'll even get them up to 10,000. Yeah, so I don't like, so they use vitamin D2, um, which just isn't as good for the body, So, but it's synthetic, so they can patent it, so it's a prescription. Um, so I don't like the vitamin D2, but it's as easy, but I don't mind, like I've put a couple of my patients just on once a week, um, and it is fat soluble, so you don't have to take it every day. It's not like B vitamins where, you know, you need to sort of take it every day to support if, uh, you know, you need it. So you can take it every day and you can do 10,000. Some people can even do 50,000 um, and be okay, but that, those people you would want to monitor and make sure, and I would prefer that you would just go buy a supplement that's vitamin D3 that's more absorbable and utilized than to do the prescription. So, and I've had a couple people come to me on prescriptions and have noticed the same thing, like they don't get their levels up. So, and a lot of those prescriptions, unfortunately too, have binders and other things too that they put in there. So I would rather that you just do a supplement. So, cause instead of the vitamin D2. Yep. Right. I've heard this uh, before and a lot of my So yeah, so a couple different things there is that um, just from a long-term use that, that there's a couple things that where the liver can be affected. You're going to be re releasing a lot more being on antibiotics, like a lot more byproducts too, which you're, anything that's in your body, your liver ultimately has to be that manufacturer and that chemical factory that gets it out. Uh, the other thing that I think is a huge component that I think we'll learn more and more about is the effect of the microbiome and how much the liver is even dependent on those bacteria. So uh, I think you're getting sort of a twofold. And right now, um, you guys might know this, but there's a great microbiome summit going on that's free uh, where they are interviewing a bunch of people on the forefront of the microbiome. Um, and so right now, if you just search Microbiome Summit, for the next couple days, they're um, putting all of those talks free. But one of the things that we're learning is that we sort of know the importance of it in the gut. We're learning more about it in the brain, but even the liver, because uh, of what the liver has to do, it's really response needs those good bacteria. So uh, that's where uh, I think it's a good idea if you're going to do antibiotics like long term, which some people need, is to even cycle it a little bit so that the, let the liver sort of pick up and, and uh, get better. Steve? Um, you mentioned that one, the one antibiotic that you guys use. Yep. Will that go after um, candida also? So, because candida is a yeast, so not as much. Now, the interesting thing is the herbs will because the herbs are berberine and oregano, and they have a high affinity towards yeast. Um, but the probiotic we use, Saccharomyces boulardii, also goes after candida. So one of the best things that I put any of my candida patients on is Saccharomyces boulardii, and that will really help to not only go after the yeast, but keep that good yeast up so it doesn't keep coming back. Um, but the rifaximin itself doesn't really have an ability to kill off yeast. So realistically, um, antibiotics have done this to a lot of people that don't even have Lyme disease, correct? I mean, the doctors, yeah. just, I mean, in the last 30 years, they've just loaded everybody up with antibiotics. Yeah. And, and then after two or three weeks or a month of it, your stomach's just screwed. Yeah. And there you go, you know? Mm -hmm. SIBO is 100% a byproduct of our current state. Uh, we would not see SIBO back uh, 
even I would say 100 years ago. So I think you know our food plays a role in it, obviously antibiotics. Our fear of bacteria has really done this um, because of the fact that uh, you know, and this is actually sort of something that is a little bit of a pet peeve, but I do it in speeches, good versus bad bacteria. It's supposed to be a balance. And unfortunately, with the way that we've sort of prescribed antibiotics, and we're going away from it a little bit now, but, you know, especially back in the 80s and 90s, it was let's get everybody on it. Um, and so that's what sort of sets us up to be able and to see this in more and more people and in a, in a large amount of people. Mm -hmm. Are you, like, three different kinds? So I think it depends. Uh, if you feel like you're very depleted, like if you've been on a lot of antibiotics, if you've been on broad spectrum antibiotics, excuse me, then I would highly recommend to, you know, choose, you know, three to five. And look at the different strains. So you always want one with a lot of, like, lactobacillus in it. Lactobacillus tends to do more of the upper GI, so we see it more in the stomach and upper part of the small intestine. But then even in that family, there are so many different benefits. Um, there's one called Raminus, which we actually have done a ton of research on with ADHD in the brain um, and seen great results in research about what uh, Raminus has done um, to um, brain development, especially in kids. Um, Rutelli is another one that we see a lot of great things with. Uh, and then, yep, yep. So, and I mean, you don't have to remember what each one does. Um, you don't have to be completely nerdy like I am. But um, it's just sort of important to realize that, like, it's not just about, you know, lactobacillus acidophilus is the one that gets the spotlight. But it's not the full picture by any means. And then uh, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii is one I highly recommend for individuals, especially anyone that's been on antibiotics or anybody that's got a chronic uh, concern, because Saccharomyces boulardii can be a game changer. And then to make sure you're getting good bifidobacterium too, which tends to do the lower part of the gut and the large intestine. But the easiest thing to do, because you'll drive yourself crazy, is just pick th three, pick four. Um, if you feel depleted, take all three of those at the same time for a couple months. Um, if you feel like you're just trying to keep a good balance, like what I do is I just switch each bottle. And I go probably between five to six different kinds. Um, you throw out some. You're looking for brand names, or? Yeah, I'm looking for. Yeah, she's looking for. Yeah. Yeah, but I understand what you're saying because my doctor was saying she was really important. I have the fact for tidings. Yeah, Bellardi. Um, so I find that there's good companies. I should say that Claire Labs, um, K L A I R E, does a great job with their probiotics. Um, I actually really like Dr. Perlmutter's too, which I think you can find even in like a Whole Foods or co-op. Um, Claire Labs, I think you'd have to go online to find them. Um, I use in my office uh, Zymogen a lot, but they uh, that don't sell online, so you'd have to have a practitioner that uses them. Orthomolecular is another one you can find online, so that's O-R-T-H-O-M-O-L-E. C-U-L-A-R. And you don't have to refrigerate those. Yeah. Which is handy when you're traveling. Yep. There's a lot of really good ones now that um, prepare them. Uh, a lot of them like flash freeze them so that they'll keep the probiotic alive, um, but that they won't, um, you don't have to refrigerate them. So that is really nice. Um, Pure Encapsulation has some good ones. And then there's a lot, there are a lot of other ones out there. So, but I would say those are probably the ones I like the most that are pretty easy to find. The other question I get a lot, fermented foods do a great job. I'm, I really think, and I think there's a reason why every culture has their fermented food, whether it's miso or sauerkraut, um, is because there's so much power and we've known that for, you know, generations and decades. Uh, the question I always get though is, well, what, can I just eat a lot of yogurt? I don't like our fermented choice of uh, our yogurts because what happens is they do dump bacteria or probiotics in there, but they're putting it in a pasteurized substance. So I think by the time you get it, you're not going to get your levels up as much. Now raw, you know, uh, yogurt, kefir, kombucha, if you can handle those things, 
are wonderful. Yep. So the good thing about it is that if it's made right, the sugar's gone to feeding the bacteria. It's not going to you. Not much sugar in it, really. Yeah. It shouldn't be. Yep. That's the beauty of the what the bacteria have done with it. But um, yeah, no, as long as you've let it ferment the way it is, you're not getting the sugar. So you're not going to get that insulin, So, which is nice. So it, it tastes like you are, but it's not, So which is good. There's um, two kind of B12 injectables. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between those? I love that question. So <laughs> because... So there's actually three. So there's one called cyanocobalamin, um, and you actually, these are injections, but you can also, if you look on the back of your uh, multivitamin, you can see it too. So cyanocobalamin is the cheap B12. So it's a synthetic B12 and it's a cheap B12. Um, and that's what they prescribe. And that's what they prescribe, yep. So if you go to your medical doctor, they'll give you cyanocobalamin. You'll still use that unless you are extremely inflamed, especially in the gut. Um, or uh, you are not a good methylator. So if you have like the MTHFR, COMT, or a gene like that, which is a lot of people. And it's especially, you know, a huge concern then for the chronically sick because you don't want to get these methylation um, pathways, not to get the support they want, but then also to sort of gunk them up. So cyanocobalamin, what a lot of places will do is start you on cyanocobalamin, you'll feel awful, and they'll say, we'll change you to methyl.